So uh, thanks for all coming tonight. My name is Greg Allen, and I'm going to help moderate tonight. And also tonight uh, speaking will be Attorney George Bird and Officer De Deputy Brandon Epp and Officer Chuck Reed here from Bowser's Estates, L.A. County Alameda Sheriff's Department. They'll be sharing their experience of what they what they do and what they see in the community and working with kids. And uh, I want to, uh, isn't it great to be at Saks Fifth Avenue? <laughs> That's where we are. You all know that, right? Right. We're part of it. So this is called the community room, the promenade. I want to thank the promenade for uh, hosting this and also Whole Foods of Torrance uh, donated all the, the food over there and snacks. So you feel free to go over there during our, our evening and help yourself. And I also want to thank RPV TV for being here tonight. Maria and Mark, they do a great job. Okay, so uh, my name is Greg Allen, and anybody heard me speak before? Who's heard me speak before? Okay, my family's not here, they've heard me speak a lot. Okay, so I am a, uh, I grew up here, and I had four kids. I'm a local therapist here in the community, and might as well say who my father was, right? George, my, my father was George Allen, the football coach. Anybody ever heard of him? No. So you guys are so young. Three people. Wow, really getting old. Okay, fine. Anybody over 30 is very excited about that fact. Or 40, we'll say now. Yeah. Okay, if you have to go to the bathroom, it's pretty hard to find way through here or there's ones outside. And uh, there's a lot of uh, material over there. I want you to go through there after. There's uh, handouts on... Uh, parenting, uh, connecting with your kid, understanding your kids, and a lot of other, uh, some life skills workshops that are, that are over there. So the, the reason we're doing this tonight is I kind of wanted to provide an overview of, of what we kind of here. see going on with uh, teens in our community here. Uh, each school does their own uh, parent night. The middle schools have the quest nights and the high schools have parent nights each semester covering a variety of topics. Actually, there's one tonight at Peninsula. And uh, so tonight is a little more of an overview of, of uh, kind of, you know, what we see going on. And, and our community here is uh, a wonderful community, as you know, which is probably why you live here. It's as beautiful as just about anywhere in the world, you know, in terms of the nature, right? And, uh, and our kids are really provided with a lot of wonderful opportunities that a lot of kids uh, don't have. The, the Education Foundation, the support from the community uh, for the schools is just fantastic and it's incredible, the, all the resources that are at each school. It's really, it's really unbelievable because I work with a lot of uh, schools throughout the South Bay and school districts and they don't have what we have here. So it's, it's thanks to you and, and others in the community helping but it's also the school district does a great job and, uh, and all, the, all the individuals working at the schools. So one of the things that's been looked at the last few years is the, the cost of having a high achieving academic focus and is there a cost for that? We're trying, you know, we're really focused on getting our kids into great colleges, right? And uh, personally, I think we're over focused on that. And by the way, you don't have to listen, to, you don't have to agree with anything I say tonight. Okay, that's okay with me, <laughs> all right? But if you, if you think back on <clears throat> right now, how, how important is it the college that you went to. It's pretty important, right? Pretty proud of your alma mater and, and where you went, right? It's pretty important. But it's probably maybe more important maybe if you went to graduate school where that was, or maybe what's more important is maybe who you married, right? Or maybe what's, you know, another issue to focus on with our kids is maybe character, the kind of people we are, right? I know this is not a very popular topic. Okay, so what I feel we get a little bit overly focused on achieving, on accomplishing, you know, and I've, I've grown up that my dad was a hard driving, accomplishing person that, you know, was not home a lot for weeks. I'd see my dad on TV, and, oh, there's dad. I'd get up and he was gone, and I'd go to bed and he wasn't home yet. So he was, he was gone, he was working hard, he loved us, he was providing for us. But he was gone a lot, and there was a real disconnect for me personally and our family. And that's part of the difficulty I see with teenagers. There's a disconnect between the teen world and the adult world. And 
our kids uh, experience a lot of stress. The number one reason now for using alcohol and using drugs across the country is to deal with, cope with stress. Whereas 10 or 15 years ago, the number one reason was to fit in or be cool with your friends. Okay, so a lot of kids are drinking or using drugs or smoking marijuana just to relieve the tension, the pressure, and the stress that they feel. And, and the stress is, is usually because they're doing so much stuff. There was a, the teen panel in the Peninsula News a few years ago, a student panel from all the high schools, they asked the kids, how many extracurricular activities are you involved in? And it was something like 55% of the kids had five to nine extra things they were involved in. Five to nine extra things besides schoolwork. So, you know, lessons, rehearsals, practices, you know, service things. So our kids are really overscheduled, they're overbooked, that's what I feel. Not everybody, but we're definitely on that side. And uh, kids don't know how to relax, they don't know how to have fun in a healthy way. Uh, one of the things I helped found 10 years ago is uh, Freedom For You. It's a youth nonprofit organization here in the Hill for that purpose, to provide safe, supervised activities, healthy outlets for kids that they could go to and, and participate in versus going to a house party. Okay, those of us who work with kids, we hear every, every week, I hear all the you know, stories of you know, bad things that happen. You know? We've had six kids die in the last two years up here. That's not including the boy who jumped off the cliff a few weeks ago, that he wasn't from our area. We've had six kids die, teenagers. Okay, from car accidents, a couple, su <coughs> couple suicides, overdoses, drugs. And those are the ones we know about. There's, there's probably more, you know, and I'm not trying to glamorize anything, but that's uh, six deaths. Okay, besides that, how many injuries there's been, how many addictions there's been, how many legal issues have happened, how many kids have been arrested. Kids live at risk. What I see has kind of happened now is the college lifestyle, you know, the college lifestyle, right? Party hard and go crazy. It's kind of moving into the high school now, the high school realm. You know, the, the rivalries, the competition, the hard drinking, the, you know, just going crazy partying. It's, it's moving into the, the high school level. So kids are really at risk. Every weekend, anything can happen with any kid. Any bad thing can happen. And uh, parents, as I, as I see, are kind of disconnected from their kids. And we need to get more connected. Um, just a little bit of some drug information. It used to be people would get drugs from drug dealers. Okay, now these uh, marijuana clubs, if you're 18, you can go to a marijuana club and you can go there and a doctor will write a prescription for you. It doesn't matter what you tell them, you're going to get a prescription for marijuana, okay, for pot, which is now called weed, which it used to be called a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, so you can go in there. So now 18-year-olds, uh, rite of passage, on their birthday, they want to have it on their card, that it's their birthday on their card, they go and they get a club card and they can buy all kinds of marijuana. They can buy stuff they can eat. It's in all these foods and all types, you know, all types of stuff. And uh, though the kids who have the cards are the kids now that are giving, passing on the, the marijuana to the younger kids. So the dealers now are, are juniors and seniors in school. Kids get fake IDs so they go to a marijuana club. Not to go to the dance club, so they can go get some pot. Okay, so it's very pervasive and it's, it's happening in many, many places. There was an article in the Peninsula High School newspaper, the recent one, that said, kind of this great debate, who's responsible for teens drinking so much? Are parents responsible or are teens responsible? Because a Stanford uh, professor was arrested, his kids in high school, and he was arrested for serving alcohol. All these kids got drunk at his house, and then they went out, and they did whatever, they had car accidents. And him and his, his, his wife didn't know the kids were drinking in his house. They, they, there's a lot of parents that allow their kids to drink at their house, right? You guys know that, right? You're not surprised by that. When I ask kids, you go to a party, what was the party like? Yeah, how many kids were there? Was there beer? Was there, what was there? They're doing shots. Were kids smoking pot? Yeah. Were kids in the back maybe having sex? Yeah, yeah. Were there pills? Well, there could have been. Were there adults there? Yeah, there was adults there. Did they know? Yeah, the kid, they were there you know, cleaning up after us, following us around with rags. And so most of the parties that are going on the hill, and there's a lot of parties. Almost every weekend there's a party. Uh, adults know about it, so adults are allowing it. And um, that's not good. So the article is like, who's responsible? The parents responsible or the kids responsible? So it's probably 50-50. But uh, kids live in a kind of a secret world. 
that uh, we don't know about. And there's a handout over there on technology. And if you want to supervise your kid, you're going to have to upgrade your technology skills. Okay? Because if you can't figure out the cell phones and the internet and websites and uh, all the ways kids can communicate, you're not going to really know what you, what's going on with your son or your daughter, what's in their heart, what's in their mind, what they're, what they're about. You're not going to know because you can't just ask them or talk to someone anymore. Kids live through the internet now. So there's a great handout over there on uh, parenting with uh, technology, and there's some really good websites to kind of explain everything to parents about what to look for and how to, how to supervise that. Now, if your kids are older, how many of you have a senior in high school? And how many of you have a junior? And, okay, and a sophomore? And freshman? And how many junior high? <coughs> okay, good. Junior high, you still got a chance there. <laughs> they still actually care about what you think, they care about your opinion. They still kind of want to please you. Okay, those are really important. Actually, they say across the country, 25% of high schoolers do not drink or use drugs in high school. 25%. Where's that? <laughs> and they ask them, why didn't you party in high school? And the main reason they say was they didn't want to disappoint their parents. So that means to me, they're still very connected to their parents. Usually a younger kid doesn't want to disappoint mom and dad, right? They want their their uh, approval, they care about their opinion. A lot of high schoolers, they don't care about what we think, right? But all the, all the literature, all the recommendations for working with, for parents and working with teenagers, all the websites, all the stuff everywhere across the country, there's a consistent theme. I can save you a lot of time looking. <laughs> it's to try to engage your kids in conversation, okay, versus, you know, uh, letting them do whatever they want, or being overly independent, try to engage them in conversation. Most kids would like to talk to their parents, but they're not able to because their parents are too stressed out. And if, if they actually told their parent what they're thinking or what their friends are doing or what's going on, the parents would have like a little bit of an anxiety reaction. <laughs> okay? So if you want, you, no one wants to talk to someone that's going to get all upset. Right? Like you don't want to. If you go to someone, you tell them something, they're like, what? what, what, what and you're like, okay, I'm not going to talk to that person, even if it's your, your parent. All right? So you have to do with, with what a trained therapist are trained to do. When someone says something that's very alarming and very shocking, you just have to go, uh huh. <laughs> okay? You have to not react. <clears throat> Later, you can go into your bedroom, scream in the pillow. So I can't believe it, they're doing this and that. Okay? You have to not react. Because if you, you know, put all your anxiety and your fear on your kid, they're not going to want to talk to you. Okay? So you're going to have to learn to control your emotions, control your reaction. You need to use questioning, not interrogation, but just questioning to kind of say, talking about topics and talking about issues, talking about what are kids doing or what do you think about this, talking about values, talking about decisions they have to make. And just having, trying to have it that you could brainstorm about ideas. I know this sounds like an ideal, right? Because you want your kids to be able to talk with you about stuff. And you need to, all the, like I said, the summary of all the literature and education everywhere is to try to connect parents and teens together more, or junior high kids. So doing activities together. It's, a, it's an amazing statistic. They said families that eat one meal together a day have like, 35% less potential for all kinds of problems, for depression, for acting out behavior, for substance use, all kinds of stuff, just because they eat together. And they're probably not having a therapy session when they're eating, right? They're just being together, doing activities together, finding common things to do together with your kids. It's great, we got some dads here. Let's hear it for the dads. <laughs> When I got all the RSVPs, I think we got about 40 moms and one dad, I said. But we have more than one here, so that's good. <laughs> so teenagers need the fathers really bad. Okay, we're logical, we're cavemen, you know, we're, we're teenagers can provide, I mean fathers, <laughs> can provide sort of the rudder to steer the ship through the stormy teen years. They really can. Okay, the boys and girls need to do stuff with their dads activities and, and hang out together, do things together. You don't have to be talking about all these heavy, serious things. Just being together, doing things. Grounds the kids and connects them to you 
and connects them to your values and how you want their life to go, okay? So that's one really important tip I want you to take away from here. You need to work together with your partner, okay? When my son was younger, he used to talk to me all the time. My daughter talked to my wife. For some reason, they switched later. My daughter starts talking to me about her personal life. My, my son won't talk to me anymore about my personal life. I ask him, hey, what's going on with this and that? He goes, oh, the inquiring father would like to know, wouldn't he? <laughs> and I'm like, well, I was just asking a question. He says, well, you can leave that chapter out of your book. I'm like, well, excuse me. I'm not writing a book. And then my daughter's like, oh, I'm not talking about this, all this stuff. You know, they, they would talk. So me and my wife, we confer. I tell her, go ask her all these things. Ask him all these questions. And she's like, well, can you ask her, blah, blah, Can you ask him? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you say? Really? Okay, ask him this. So then we talk together, we confer together as a, as a tag team about, you know, what do you think, what do you do? You know, they're not going to necessarily talk to each one of you, and you have to kind of go with the flow. But you have to, you know, try to engage them in conversation, and don't be afraid to tell your kids no. Our, our, uh, our generation, I'm older than most of you, but a lot of parents are just really permissive, and they're afraid to tell their kids no. And there's a lot of kids that are running families. They use their anger. They use conflict, they use, you know, causing stress and disagreement and all that tension you feel when you're, they're disagreeing with what you say. They use that to get their way. You know, that you don't want to have to go through a 20 minute thing about why you don't want them to go out or do this or whatever. So, that, you know, they're kind of, you know, bullies in some ways that way, you know, just uh, kind of running the show. So I think you need to be the parent. You know, you need to be the parent. And the main reason I was really hands-on with my kids is I was unsupervised. And me and my brothers, we just did whatever we wanted. We got in all kinds of trouble, and we almost wrecked our lives many times over. And so I decided I was going to supervise my kids and stay on top of them more and, uh, you know, see what was happening with them. But also because all the damage that's going on with kids that I happened to see, I wanted to protect my kids as much as I could. We can't protect our kids as much as we can when they're three, four, and five, right? But when your kids are little and they're six, seven, and eight years old, and they go, I met this kid at school and I want to go to his house, you didn't go, okay, see you later, bye. Right? You want to go and see who's over there, what's going on at that house? You know, who's in that house? What are these parents like, right? You don't just let your, your elementary kid just go. But when they get to be teenagers because they're smart and bright and intelligent, maybe getting good grades and they're good in sports, then we just let them go. And all the kids are doing wild and crazy stuff everywhere. They're doing it because they can, because there's cracks in the supervision in the parent parental relationship. Or the parents are really busy, or very stressed out, or we have our own problems going on, and we can't manage our kids or stay, you know, supervise the kids. So they just kind of morph towards, you know, maybe peer groups that aren't healthy or activities that aren't healthy. So I know it's hard to be a parent. I would want to commend you for coming out tonight and shows that you care and you really care about what's happening with your kids. And uh, we're gonna move on here. And then let, we're gonna save the questions till after, then we have a microphone, we wanna we have time for you guys to ask us questions, okay? So, at this point I wanna ask uh, Charles Reed to come on up and share. Thank you. Here we go. Good evening everyone, how are we doing tonight? My name is Officer Charles Reed. I work for the Palos Verdes Estates Police Department. Um, I'm currently assigned to patrol there. Uh, I've been with the department for six years, coming up at the end of this year. Um, I've worn a lot of hats there. I started off as a reserve police officer, worked my way into becoming a dispatcher, and then a jailer, and then ultimately in the patrol. I've uh, been fortunate enough within the last year to be asked to teach the student in the law class at Palos Verdes High School. Um, it's a new program that we started at the beginning of last year. We're in our second semester, and so far it's been very successful. Um, I got into this job kind of different than most police officers do. Most police officers know that this is something that they want to do when they grow up. They're, you don't want to be a firefighter or a police officer when they grow up. With me, it came down to one inc incident where, like Dr. Allen was talking about, I wasn't the best kid growing up. And I didn't know what path I wanted to follow. Um, up until I started working in law enforcement, the only experience I had with teenagers was being one at one point. And one day as a teenager, I happened to fit the description of an individual that was involved in an armed bank robbery that just occurred. 
and my vehicle fit the description as well. So that being said, the Torrance Pel Police Department Cavalry came out, found me driving, and a high incident, high risk felony traffic stop took place. Uh, I was taken out at gunpoint, streets had shut down, they had pulled me out of the car, and when all was said and done, I wasn't the guy. <laughs> and I went home telling my parents about it, and my parents were furious. They were furious with what had happened to me. And then I thought that day, what was so wrong about what they had done had I been the guy? Had I been the person that they were looking for, how would anything they had done been any different? And then I felt that much safer, safer about living in the city I lived in. That too, um, it was a lot of fun. They had a lot of fun. I didn't have any fun. Yet. <laughs> they had a lot of fun. So then I got into law enforcement, and as I started to have experience with teenagers, unfortunately, it was more so on the negative variety, because it was people that I was contacting in my line of work. Um, additionally, my other experience with teenagers was that I had a teenage brother-in-law that was in high school. And I had learned that the teenage dynamic had changed completely since when I was in school. One of the things I learned, the social networking and the technology that exists today in schools and for teen teenagers, it's like nothing that we've ever had before. I remember when I was in high school, you were cool if you had a pager. <laughs> Nowadays, I asked my class if they even knew what a pager was, and they looked at me with puzzled looks on their face. So that alone right there is a, it's, it's a major problem because they have access to so many things through that technology. Facebook, MySpace, Twitter, all these things. The iPhone. The iPhone in the wrong hands is a dangerous tool. Um, some of the other things that I noticed, too, was the peer pressure. Peer pressure has always been present. I remember when I was in high school, but for some reason nowadays, it just seems like it's a stronger driving force amongst kids and why they do things in school. Some of the other things, the drug use. We talk about how easily accessible it is nowadays. Um, it's an easy outlet for stress. I've asked my students that have participated in drug use, I ask them, why do they do it? And they say it's, it's an easy outlet for stress. It's something that's easy to get a hold of, something they don't have to think about. It's a decision they get to consciously make themselves to use or not use, and there's no repercussions for it, they think. The other thing I notice is the pressure that is on kids. Dr. Allen spoke to it already, the stress that these kids are under these days. Is it manifested by teachers? Is it manifested by parents? Where does it come from? Is it their own desire to produce, to perform, to do well? I think it's a combination of all kinds of other things. Um, right now I'm in a unique position as both a patrol officer and someone who's working with students at the high school to be able to see both aspects of that. Um, some of the things that I've seen in that is, like I mentioned, that pressure, that pressure to produce, succeed, it's put an unbelievable amount of stress on kids these days. Uh, schools are more competitive. One of the things I noticed is the difference in admissions between Peninsula and PD High was based on API scores. People were changing schools based on IP API scores because they wanted to go where the school was going to pre present their child a better chance to get into a better school, like Dr. Allen mentioned. One of the, especially on the Peninsula community, we really see it. Um, recently in the news, I'm sure everyone's aware of the incident with the cheating and the individuals at PD High School. Um, being part of the investigation, the one thing I remember all three of the students mentioning, all three of the students that were involved were good students. They were taking AP classes. Doesn't condone any of the behavior that they did exhibit, but they all mentioned that the pressure for them to succeed at home was one of the things, the driving forces behind what they did. Um, another little story, uh, I'm working patrol one day and I see a vehicle blow through a stop sign. Stop the car and there's a young female in the car. I walk up, start talking to her and I can see that she's getting ready to break down and start crying. So I look at her and ask her, I said, are you okay? And then floodgates open, she started falling. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, she thinks she's gonna get a ticket right now. Here we go. She looks up at me and I said, are you okay? Is everything okay? And she looks and said, you wouldn't understand. I said, oh, try me. She says, I'm in AP chemistry. I'm so close to getting an A in my class and I just got an 84 on a test. 
and she starts crying uncontrollably again. Now, that was either a very elaborate ruse to get out of a ticket, and <laughs> touche, because it worked, but <laughs> I, 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 tell my, I tell my students, the truth has a certain ring to it, and she was telling me the truth. Uh, Dr. Allen and I were talking about another story in which he was, knew of a second grade teacher that had to console a child in his class because the child was upset because he didn't do something right or wasn't doing something well, and he needed to do it right, he needed to do it well because he needed to get into Stanford. And that, that's second grade, so the pressure on these kids, it's, it's immense. Um, some of the other things we talk about all the time is we talk about the drug problem. Um, everyone's quick to point out that the drugs originate in the schools, that it's a school problem. But in my experience out in the field, it's a community problem. It doesn't start in the schools. You have teachers that may be involved in the same type of drug activity that the children are. So it's not just the schools, it's actually in your community. Um, not to say that it isn't found in other schools as opposed to the ones in our community, it's everywhere, we find it everywhere. Uh, one of the reasons it is a problem too is because a lot of parents aren't in touch with the kids in their social settings. Kids come home from school, one of the first things you probably ask them, hi, how was school today, what's going on? And it becomes more of a formality, more of a routine, as opposed to, talk to me, what's really going on? What are you really doing? The weekends, the weekends, the devil's hands can be at work because they're not in that school setting. A lot of parents are in touch with what that social setting is your child may be in. Um, I mentioned the availability of drugs nowadays, from marijuana to pills to the, to the much dangerous varieties of drugs, it's easier for them to get a hold of it. This is, like I mentioned before, it's also an easy stress outlet for them. I mentioned I spoke to my students and I asked them, they said it's easy to get a hold of and it's an easy way to relieve stress. It's, something they don't, it's, a, it's a time where they don't have to think about things that are going on. Um, in my brief experience with dealing with the teenagers in both these settings, those are some of the major issues I see. And then so I sat down and I tried to think of solutions, things that we can do both as parents, police officers, attorneys, therapists, anyone to help these kids. And I go back to my childhood and when I was brought up. And one of the things that I learned early on was accountability for your actions. Um, you need to hold them accountable for actions. Love your children endlessly, love them endlessly for everything they do, but do not enable them by allowing destructive, delinquent behavior. So often, like Dr. Allen mentioned it, we do that. We allow this behavior, we don't hold people accountable for their actions. We see that with adults as well. It's not just exclusive to teenagers, it's adults too. Deputy Epp will speak to that as well, I'm sure. Um, place the responsibilities for the choices they make in perspective and allow them to be accountable for their own choices. Another thing is activities and outlets for stress relief. And when I talk about activities and outlets for stress relief, I don't mean school-related activities. Dr. Allen mentioned it. Students are in five to nine different school-related activities or activities like that. They need other outlets to where they can go and release their stress. They need other areas where they can go out and release their stress. Um, families, religious groups, uh, local areas, like the, some of the foundations that Dr. Allen provided are good outlets for that. We see in the, some of the other communities, the, the midnight basketball leagues or the parks that are staying open until midnight. They're giving students, they're giving kids another outlet, another place to go to where they can be active and they're not in the element where they're getting in trouble. They're not in an element with drugs. They have these outlets available to them. Um, Lastly, and more important, is communication. Uh, healthy marriages, successful businesses, effective school environments, all rely on effective communication. It's important to keep an open door policy when it comes to this. Listen to your kids, communicate with them. Don't make it a formality. Make it something where it's genuine, it's sincere, where you're actually speaking with your kids, fully engaged in what they have to say. You may not always like what they have to say. You may not always want to hear what they have to say, but the fact that they're able to speak with you about it speaks volumes to what you can mean to that chip, to that child. It's important that you guys do that. Um, 
it's important to make sure it is communication, that you're not dictating, that you're not talking down. It's still important to remember to be a parent first, never to be a friend. You're their parent, be their parent. They have friends, they don't need a friend, they need a parent. Um, Colin Powell once said, being a good leader, being a good parent, means sometimes pissing people off. It's gonna happen. The kid's not always gonna wanna hear what you have to say, but it goes both ways. You may not wanna always have to hear what they have to say, but it's important that you guys both talk back and forth. Um, another thing is, don't dwell on the past. We all make mistakes. Teenagers are going to make mistakes. It's important that you hold them accountable for the actions that they have done, the choices that they have made. Discipline, communicate, and then move on. Because what's important is what they do from that point out. It's important to address the issue when it happens, but it's also important to give them the, the understanding and the confidence that you still have confidence in them to do good. I've heard too often that they fear that by the time someone's reached the teenage years, they're lost, there's no hope for them, that they won't listen to us, there's nothing we can say or do. Well, I can tell you just in the short experience I've had teaching this class at the high school, it's the furthest from the truth. Kids have an insatiable knowledge or curiosity for knowledge. We just have to find what it is they're curious about. One of the things I've done in my classes, I found obviously, they see the uniform walk in, they want to know about cool cop stuff. <laughs> I could structure a class based on stories alone. I could sit there and I could tell stories for two hours a day, every day, we'd all have the best time. We'd never accomplish anything in class, so, but having a good time. So what I've done with them is I've structured part of my class to the end. We have an ask a cop session. And what they get to do within the last 10 to 15 minutes, they get to ask any question they want, but it has to be related to the subject matter we talked about that day. And I found in that time period, the questions that they have are amazing. They have perceptive questions, they want to know things. Initially I thought, they're trying to find out how to get out of things. They're trying to find a way around, <laughs> and they're trying to circumnavigate the system. But then the more and more I talk to them, I found out they just want to know, they just want to learn. They found something that was interesting to them, they were fully engaged in it, and we had an open line of communication that we were able to discuss with. Um, been doing this for six years now, just started teaching the class. I'm teaching these kids a lot, I like to think, but I think I'm learning more from them than I'm teaching them right now. So I'm looking forward to keeping this going and hope to have a positive influence in these kids' lives and probably some of your kids' lives. So thank you, Dr. Allen, for having me. Thank you for having me. All right, that was great. Thanks, Charles. There's, there's some empty seats up here, Kyle, if anybody else comes in. There's some single ones here and there. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Deputy Epley, it's your turn. Can I just say what he said and sit down? And <laughs> that was very good. Uh, hi, my name is Deputy Brandon Epp with the LA County Sheriff's Department, obviously. Uh, I started with Sheriff's Department 21 years ago. I, my first stint was at Men's Central Jail. I spent six years there. And after uh, six years of that, I decided to... Uh, better my life and, and go to a nice friendly place. And so I came to this nice hill you guys live on top of. Um, I came to uh, Lamita Station in 1997. I did my patrol stint for a few years and then I was offered a job as a community resource uh, deputy which also uh, gave me a, basically an a invitation into all your classrooms and, and all your schools as a school resource uh, deputy. So I've been doing that uh, for gosh almost 10 years now. I too teach student law, um, probably not as well as Officer Reed, but I, I try, uh, and, and I do, I, I agree with him, we learn a lot. We, we teach some, but we learn a lot, and, and all the kids are great up here, that's, that's the bottom line. Um, gosh, he covered a lot of stuff, which is great. Uh, I'll, I'll just go with a couple of stories. First of all, I kept telling myself, I just say this, say this, say this. Kids, the, the, and, and they've been doing this since they were little, kids blame. When a kid does something wrong, the first thing they do to spread out the guilt is blame. They do it uh, when they do something wrong from, a, from, a, from an early age, and, the, and it never stops. Uh, and, and the biggest blame I see going around with, with the kids is, is this quote. 
uh, everyone's doing it. We hear that all the time up here. Gosh, what's going on at Penn High? Everyone's doing drugs. You know, and the kids tell me, oh, everyone does drugs up here. Well, it's not the case. It's actually a small percentage of the kids that are doing the drugs. Now, there might be a large percentage that try it at some point. They're going to try uh, drinking alcohol. They're going to try marijuana. They're going to try a cigarette. Uh, but those kids that actually go into the heroin and the methamphetamine, that's a very, very small population. But as soon as they get caught, the first thing they say is, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. Everyone's doing it. And I was at a party, and I didn't want to be the only kid at that party of 300 kids that wasn't doing uh, this. And, and it goes with homework, too. They get a bad test score. Oh, mom, everyone failed that test. Everyone did. Yeah, yeah, everyone did. Teacher hates us. She's teacher's a jerk. Um, yeah, pretty much failed everyone. So it, it, I, I don't, you know, they have excuses for everything, but I don't, I, what the one, one of the messages I want you guys to take home tonight is, because I've been approached by this. Where should I send my kid to school? Because I heard PV has problems. And I heard should I, I heard I should send the PV because Penn has problems. There's no school is, is any worse than the other. Uh, I, let me rephrase that. No school is any better than the other. <laughs> Put it positive. Uh, there's no more drug use at any of these high schools up here than across the United States. It's it's on par. It's it's just out there. It's easy to get. Um, it's cheap. A lot of these drugs are just cheap right now. And with the new marijuana laws, uh, a lot of these kids have older brothers and sisters and parents that uh, provided for them uh, unknowingly or knowingly. And uh, I have actually come across a juvenile with a medical marijuana card. Uh, and and I, it baffled my brain. I called our narcotics crew downtown. I said, is this possible? I have a 16-year-old kid with a medical marijuana card. Is it, and, they, and they did their research, and it's the first time they heard of it, and they said, well, yeah, it's medicine. So if a doctor prescribes it, it's not a drug at that point, or a legal drug, it's, it's medicine. So a juvenile can possess a, a medical marijuana card. Yeah, good stuff. But a parent had to sign off on that. So, you know, you gotta go back to the parents. One thing I teach uh, in, in a lot of the lectures I do with parents is, your house is your house. It's, it's yours. Every room in that house is yours. It's not your child's. If you want to know what your child is doing when they're at school or they're out, you have to search their room. You have to get in there. You have to, hey, put rubber gloves on if you're worried. You know, tear that room apart. You'll find something. Look at their school books. Look at their folders. Look what they draw pictures of. Any kid I've ever taken out of any of the high schools up here, or the, the middle schools, for marijuana or psilocybin, mushrooms, they draw pictures of it. And you'll find pictures of it. So go through their stuff. If they're drawing little mushrooms all over the place, they might be doing mushrooms. If they're drawing <laughs> marijuana leaves, guess what? They'll tell you. Kids, like, they're proud of it. Some kids are dumb enough to put on their Facebook. I have a fake Facebook uh, account, just so I could go in and, and look at uh, some of these kids and what they're posting. They'll post pictures of themselves drinking. And by the way, I notice the kids do have an informant here tonight. <laughs> no, I'm glad you're here, actually. That's, that's good. Uh, but go through their stuff. I did a, it's probably six years ago now, I did a uh, speaking engagement much like this to the parents at Ridgecrest Intermediate. And I told the, the parents, go home, the first chance you get, search your kid's bedroom. I got a call that week from a family who said, oh my gosh, deputy up, search my son's bedroom. He was in, I think, ninth grade at the time. And uh, we found marijuana. And uh, he had a plant in his room, and we found that he had hidden his pipe and a little bag of weed in the plant. And then we searched under his bed, and we found it under his bed. And then we went in the living room, and I looked in the plants there, and he had a pipe in almost every plant in the house. So at any given time, he could walk in the house, and he, he had access to his pipes. Uh, they couldn't believe it. Uh, within weeks of that, my partner and I were driving this kid at 4 o'clock in the morning to Utah. They actually asked us to, to take him to Utah, put him in a little lockdown facility. But uh, it's hard to do. Uh, your kids do not, do not have an expectation of privacy in their bedroom. I know that I've, I've read recently that the, that law might be changing, but guess what? Who cares? It's your house. You pay for it. Um, 
and you got to know, bottom line. The, um, as you mentioned, we've had some sad deaths up here. Last year I had to call a good buddy of mine and tell him that I found his daughter, you know, dead in, of an apparent overdose in, the, in a fellow drug addict's bed. It was horrible. I hated to do that. She's a local, local girl. Very sad. Um, heroin is up here. Kids are using it. Not a lot of kids, but it's, it's here. And the point is, anything your kid wants, he could get it by the end of the day. It's, it's up here. And, and the only unique thing about this area and affluent areas is that they have the money to do so. Do you know who the biggest supplier of, of illegal narcotics is? Who's it? Parent parents. Right. I'll say the, the number one right now is, is prescription medication. We're arresting kids a lot for possession of prescription medication and then bringing it to school to sell it. You know, so you got to keep those medicine cabinets locked up tight. You got to keep your prescription meds well away from your kids yeah, because that's, that's probably one of the most abused. <laughs> alcohol, well, I'll still say alcohol is number one, weed maybe number two, but prescription meds are right up there because they're very easy to get and they do the job. They do, uh, they provide uh, anything you want. You want to be up, they got that. You want to be down, they've got that too. And it's, it's very easy to get. With that, I'm going to pass the mic. But thank you all for coming. It's, it's, it's awesome to see you here. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, just on the searching your kids' room, it's usually recommended to search their room, but do it when they're not there. <laughs> so you don't want to have a wrestling match. But definitely when you're not there, and the same thing. And parents always find stuff under the bed here, there. You know, it's not. And some parents feel like they can't search their kids' room. The kids will say it's my stuff. You're not allowed in there. But no, it's your room. It's your place. You need to take ownership of it and you know see what's going on. Okay, we're gonna transition here to Attorney George Bird and Ma Mayor Pro Tem Palos Verdes Estates. Here's George. Well, I've learned a lot tonight. I've learned don't come last uh, among speakers like you've heard. These are phenomenal speakers. I could hear Dr. Greg Allen speak every night. I always learn something <coughs> when he speaks. Uh, no one cares more about the youth of this community than Dr. Greg Allen. And rivaled with what he told you, you heard from two of our officers on the Hill who told you what's going on and what dangers your children face. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. This is phenomenal. Um, and we have nearly every seat filled here. And if you've heard some things that have made you uncomfortable, I'm here to make you more uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm a criminal defense attorney. I practice law with my wife, Karen, in here in the South Bay. And I handle a lot of juvenile cases for uh, your neighbor's children, some of your children, your friend's children. I handle criminal cases and I'm in court every single day. I also go to funerals for your children, your children's friends. You know, a couple of years ago, it was one a year, and uh, it's three a year now. Our children live with the reality that they go to school with kids that are gonna die this year. And while we have nearly 60 or 80 parents here, and thank goodness you're here, this room should be packed. This is a drop in the bucket. I was reading the newspaper two days ago, and there was an article from Simi Valley, and the article was entitled, Address Drug Deaths Officials Told They Filled the Room at City Council in Simi Valley because the parents are now organizing themselves because of deaths in their community from children in heroin. We have deaths in this community, generally about one a year to heroin. One of our local judges and some really wonderful people in our community had their son die of a heroin death at their home about five years ago. Imagine finding your child dead in the bathroom at your home from a heroin overdose. 
nothing is worse than losing a child. Nothing is worse than losing a child. And we live amongst people who have their children dying in record numbers. The school in PV has now authorized drug dogs. They're working through that issue. You know, in the olden days, when we were all uh, college students, we thought, oh, we don't want the drug dogs at our schools. We don't want to give up that privacy. And yet, we'll pack the Board of Education room when they talk about whether or not we're going to have drug dogs at the, at the schools. So we really need to become more involved, not only in our children's lives, as uncomfortable as that was to hear tonight, but also in each other's lives. We need to increase the communication, not only between you and your children, but between you and your children's friends, parents. We need to tell each other what's going on. When you learn that from your daughter that her friends are also using Xanax and drinking at parties, you need to be able to call those parents and tell them what's going on to try to save a life. Certainly you'd want to get that call. Prescription medication along with alcohol are killing our children. I had one, oh, and by the way, if I give any stories that has no, they have nothing to do with any of my clients, so if any of my clients or their families are watching, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> But I had a client whose parents were giving him a drug test for meth and pot and coke. So he started taking Xanax, so he passed the drug screen, because the drug screen was only testing illegal drugs. So my client, this young client, figured out a way to get past what proactive measures his parents were taking to pass the drug screen. He took the Xanax, crashed his car, and almost killed somebody and ended up over in the juvenile court. And I'll talk about the juvenile court a little later. So heroin is in our community. Prescription drugs being mixed with alcohol are in our community. And our children are facing these dangers uh, when they go out. When your children say they want to go to a sleepover, just because we have some ninth grade parents and high school parents, so the secret is out, I'm going to burst the bubble. When our children go to the sleepover parties, they are most likely going to be dealing with issues that you'd you don't want them to deal with at home. You don't want them to do at home. Sleepovers are a not so thinly veiled way to be involved in things that you don't want your kids involved in. So if there's a sleepover at your house, be sure to talk with the other parents, let them know you'll be there, greet the other parents, give them your home number, assure them that there's going to be no alcohol, and count noses. They say they're sleeping over at Mary's house, but they really leave Mary's house and go out and do things with their boyfriends and girlfriends, and there isn't, therefore, any curfew. And now the parents don't know what's going on because they didn't count noses, and they don't know who's coming and going. So if there's a sleepover at your house, be proactive. Count noses. And I'm going to talk about your civil liability later. If your children are going to a party, as you've heard, get out of the car, walk up to the door, meet the parents, <clears throat> say hello, get their number, give them your cell phone number, tell them about your child's peanut allergy or whatever you need to tell them, give them your business card, tell them that you happen to know a good civil lawyer, ask them if they're going to be there all <laughs> night long, ask them if they're going to be serving alcohol or if alcohol will be served, ask them if they know who else will be there. You know. Before we lived in PV, we lived somewhere um, in the South Bay, and we went to back to school night. And after I met the parents of the children our kids were going to school with, I came home and said to my wife, uh, we're moving. We, I just met the parents of the kids our kids go to school with. We're getting the heck out of Dodge. And that's when we moved up to PV, so I could have our children go to school with your children. Because our children's friends have a great deal to do with the pressures and how they grow up and what the influences them. So that was why we moved up here. We had to get out of Dodge. I didn't want any part of that. Um, and here we are now, and I'm telling you about heroin and Xanax and prescription medication and deaths, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. So get out of the car, go up, talk to the parents, get their information, and ask them if they're going to be there supervising. I have a client who had a party at their house. 
You know, these cell phones are wonderful devices, but at the same time, when there's a party, suddenly everybody gets a text of where the party is. And I had a client that had a party at their house, and before they knew it, there were 400 kids there. It's an, an obscene number of kids, and when there's that many kids, or 200 kids, they're bringing in things that you have no control, and it got so crazy so quickly, and the bottom line was, at the end of the night, my client got arrested for contributing to delinquency and furnishing because there was alcohol being served there. And my client got arrested for a party that he was supervising uh, that just went crazy. Civil liability, of course, if you're serving alcohol at your house and someone drinks and then they crash and injure somebody, you don't have enough insurance. There was a young lady, this is according to the newspaper, who was involved in an accident the morning after when she woke up after she had been to a party the night before. Alcohol goes in, it gets absorbed, we burn it off, and there takes some time to get the alcohol out of your system. If you drink and you're at a point one, two, when you go to bed at midnight, when you drive home at eight o'clock in the morning, you're still under the influence of alcohol. And so waiting an hour isn't gonna be enough. And in this particular instance, there was a terrible accident where two people on a bicycle were seriously injured, and this person was above the legal limit the next morning. And there's a lawsuit that is going on against the people who were at the house where this person was drinking the night before. In this particular instance, there's also, as part of that lawsuit, the other people in the car with the driver are being sued under a theory that perhaps they should have done something to keep this person from driving. So your child is a passenger in the car, not a driver, and suddenly you have to figure out how you're gonna defend yourself against that lawsuit or your child against that lawsuit because there was sufficient alcohol in the system the next morning there's an accident. If you provide the alcohol and you're, you're, you're involved with the providing of the alcohol, that's a crime if the child's under the age of 18 contributing to delinquency and furnishing. You have civil liability and as I said, you don't have enough insurance to cover those kinds of claims. So our children are going to be asking their parents to let me have alcohol. It's my 18th birthday, I've been good, let me have alcohol. We're gonna control it. We have children dying in our community. We have a couple more deaths this year and we'll pack this room. And when the parents came home, they of course noticed things were, you know, at least it wasn't burned down, it wasn't, nothing was stolen. Nothing was broken, but it could have had all those things could have happened. Their house had been used as a hotel for a week. Now, we have nice houses here. The jacuzzi, barbecue, food, alcohol. Yippee, it was a great party week. But and their child had known it was going on. So parties like that are going on if the parents are there or sometimes when the parents aren't there. And for the parents that don't know where their children are, this is a problem. I want to go a little further on the privacy issue. Not only do you search their cars, not only do you search their bedrooms, search under the mattress, under the bed, pull the drawers out, look behind the drawers, take their clothing when you do the laundry, and take the pockets inside out and look at the lint inside the jeans pockets. Because that's where you'll find what's left over from what was in the pockets. Be proactive. You need to be better detectives if you truly want to know what your children are doing. Searching is okay. Technology. You can obtain devices that you can put on your children's car or access their phones to find out where they go. That's okay to do. There are computer programs that you can see what keystrokes they use on the computer that you bought. 
that's okay. Wouldn't you rather know than not know or be one of those parents that's on the receiving end of a phone call from the deputies or the officers, that worst call that you can ever get about what's happened to your child? When a 15-year-old boy suddenly is using incense or candles, 15-year-old <laughs> boys smell. They don't even realize they smell. But when they're using candles or incense, they're doing it to mask or cologne, unless they're just really happening. So they're masking something. The rule at our house was when our children would come home at night, they'd have to kiss us goodnight. And when they do that, we were smelling them. Because I don't want to be surprised. No gum, no lozenges. We want to smell them. It's disgusting, but that's what we do. If your child has a lighter, it's illegal. It's illegal to have a lighter. It's the same law as having cigarettes. Now, the officers don't cite children with lighters if they're wearing a Boy Scout outfit. Because then it's clear they're maybe doing something legitimately related to being a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. Do Girl Scouts light fires? They must. I didn't know we didn't have girls. But if a boy, if a child has a lighter, yeah, they're up to no good. There's nothing to light that they have the right to light. So lighter is bad. Um, pipes, clearly pipes are bad. And that's, you know, um, if you see surgical tubing, that was a giveaway to the family who lost their son to heroin. Surgical tubing. Well, that's, there's no reason to have that sort of thing. But be, be aware of when you see masking going on, incense, candles, cologne, and gum, visine, anything out of the ordinary. You are all educated. You have intuition. You have a sense of what's going on. I have clients that come in and they say, well, we don't want to, we only fight the big things. We don't want to fight the little things. It's just alcohol. It's just pop, they say. And all of my clients who have meth problems or heroin problems tell me they started drinking and smoking pot. So it's not, it, it's not necessarily true that everybody who drinks and smokes pot does heroin or meth, but it's illegal. The answer is no, it's illegal. So if your child just tells you, hey, you know, I have dandruff or I have some condition, so the doctor will prescribe marijuana, and those marijuana, you can get, literally, I have dandruff, I have bad dreams, I have some marijuana. These doctors are amazing. Um, it's illegal, the answer is no. And even if your son or daughter is 18 and they have a medical marijuana card, if they're living in your house, you enter into a contract with anybody at your house. It's easier when they're under 18. But if they're 19, they're 18, they're 20, and they're living at your house, you enter into a contract with them. And you don't need a lawyer to write the contract. Here's the terms. I'll let you live here, I'll pay your insurance, and you're gonna do this, that, and the other. And there will be no medical marijuana. You're gonna fight those little fights because it, it all grows on one another. It's all foundational. So I would suggest that you do fight the little fights along the way. There is a deputy sheriff on the hill named Chris Knox. And Chris Knox, in my opinion, is a hero on the hill. Some of you are laughing because maybe you've also received a citation from Chris Knox. He handles, <laughs> he handles the traffic enforcement on the hill. And no one um, does a better job at trying to protect our children than Chris Knox, Deputy Chris Knox. He's a purist. He, I don't believe Chris Knox would ever buy the, I'm gonna get an 84 on my test and I'm, I, therefore, uh, and it doesn't mean, and I'm not a sound of criticism at all, but Chris Knox writes the citation when he sees the violation and it's black and white and he does it because the number one killer of children age 15 to 19, the number one leading cause of death is motor vehicle accidents. A 
parent says goodbye to their daughter to go to school last winter. And they drop her off at Peninsula High School. Her boyfriend takes her down to get a bagel on Hawthorne Boulevard. They're driving back to school up Hawthorne and they approach Palace Verde's Drive North, where as a result of the rain-slicked highway and the speed of the vehicle and the manner in which the vehicle then driven by the boyfriend is moving through the traffic, he loses control and hits a light pole, killing her at the scene. No alcohol involved, no drugs. 16-year-old girl is killed. And a wonderful young lady. And when the parents said goodbye to her that day, there was no alcohol, drugs, searching, all these other issues that we've been talking about here. It was just a motor, motor vehicle accident. That should never have happened. And that hole in that family, in their hearts, is unbelievable. Our children are at risk, not only when they're involved with alcohol or drugs, but every time they leave our home, and we know it, and they don't realize it because they're invincible. So the communication is key, is critical. You talking to your children all of the time, all of the time, and listening. I had friends that would tell me they had daughters, and they would say, how was your day, honey? And the daughter would say, why do you have to always know my business? And they would, they would have critical conversations. And my friend tells me that now that his daughter's 24, she comes home and says, how could you stand me back when I was that age? How, how, and he would say, because I loved you, and I would see you through this. It's us against the evils out there as parents that we know face our children. And so we're committed to work together, law enforcement, doctors, lawyers, parents, to communicate with our children and to communicate with each other to keep the number of deaths going down rather than going up. I hope we don't have any more this year. I'm afraid we will. Next year, we'll fill the room. And I'm committed, and I know these men are committed, to speak to any community group at any time any PTA group, any elementary school, junior high or high school, any service organizations. It, we can't speak enough in our community to try to keep our children safe and to keep children from, from dying. I want to thank you for coming. Thank you, George. That was very good. So that, that's basically why we're doing this, because we, we who work with kids see kids at, at risk. And you know, all of us went to you know, college and you know, much people party and they do risky things when they're teenagers and young adults and then they kind of get through that phase and mature and go on and have healthy, productive lives. But it's about 15 to 20 percent something happens. They don't make it through that. They have a car accident, they get addicted to something, they get arrested, someone gets raped, they get uh, you know, sidetracked, and they're not able to get through that. And so that's the risk part. Our kids live every day with a lot of risk. Most teenagers do across the South Bay. And so we're just trying to make you more aware of that, of what's going on. So one of the things, I just wanted to make you aware of freedom for you, and we're trying to keep kids safe. We're trying to develop their talents and abilities. We're trying to focus them in healthy directions. So check out the website. Get familiar with it. If you have ideas, we'll take your ideas. We get ideas from the community. OK, what works for kids, what doesn't work. A lot of students are involved in guiding things. There's a, a Changes Substance Abuse Program that we started. It's information over there. I have uh, two therapists with me tonight, Aaron Foster and Jamie Hayworth Chen over there if you want to talk to someone. And Freedom For You has an annual fundraiser. We need your help. We put uh, counselors in all the schools. We have life skills workshops. We have creative arts programs. And we have leadership and service programs. So we could use your support for that.